calorimetry. It's going to be the topic of this lesson in this chapter on thermochemistry. And this word calorimetry, it should look very similar to the word calorie. And in fact, the way we measure the number of nutritional calories in your food is through the process of calorimetry. Now, if this is your first time joining me, my name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is twofold. I want to make science both understandable, but I also hope to make learning it enjoyable. Now, this is my new high school chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year, so if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notifications. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. All right, so calorimetry here. So we're going to have a little fun here. Uh, we'll start with this equation here. So Q here is heat being transferred uh, either again into or out of a system again. C is what we call the heat capacity. So we'll come back to that in a second. And then delta T, we call that delta, always means the change in something. So delta T here is the change in temperature. So, and a delta anything here always means the final value minus the initial value. So keep in mind, your change in temperature delta T is final temperature minus initial temperature. So if your temperature goes up, then if you do final minus initial, you'll have a positive delta T. But if your temperature goes down, then when you do final minus a larger initial temperature, you'll actually find that you've got a negative delta T. So the signs are kind of important here. So again, uh, temperatures that are increasing have positive delta T's, temperatures that are decreasing are gonna have negative delta T's. Now, one other thing you should realize about a change in temperature real quick is that whether you're on the Kelvin or the Celsius scale, the numerical value of your delta T would be the same. So keep in mind, let's just say we had, you know, something going from 25 degrees Celsius to 35 degrees Celsius, your delta T would be final minus initial, 35 minus 25, and it would be positive 10 degrees Celsius temperature change. Now notice if you looked at this instead, in Kelvin, this would be add 273 to both of these. So we get 298 Kelvin to 308 Kelvin. And your delta T here would again be final minus initial and 308 minus 298 would be a 10 Kelvin temperature change. And so it's 10 either way, 10 degrees Celsius versus 10 Kelvin, but it's 10 either way. So keep in mind that temperatures in Celsius and Kelvin are not the same. They differ by a factor of 273 or 273.15 if you wanna get real specific. But delta T's are exactly the same on either scale. And that'll become relevant a little bit later on when it just won't matter which one I plug into this because it would be the same numerical value in either case. A lot of times you'll find out that we've got to do a lot of our uh, calculations using temperature in Kelvin throughout chemistry. This is one place with delta T's where that's not such a big requirement. Okay, so we often use what's called a bomb calorimeter, and a bomb calorimeter is a big, giant container, much bigger than I'm drawing it. This is not drawn to scale. It's way bigger than this, and it's got really thick insulated walls, and these insulated walls are often made of thick insulating material, but also often filled with water because water itself is fairly insulating. And again, this is not drawn to scale. It's usually way bigger than this. And so what we'll do is we'll carry out some sort of process, often a chemical reaction in here. So right in this space in here. And if that process gives off heat, then that heat is going to get transferred from the system out to the surroundings here. And based on how much the temperature goes up, we can go back and calculate how much heat was given off by this system. So with like your nutritional calories, what they're actually doing, or at least what they used to do, is they used to take your food, stick it in the center here, and they would ignite it. They'd light it on fire. So and by doing combustion with your food, they're combining it with oxygen leading to the release of CO2 and water. That's technically actually what you're doing with your food when you eat it. Your food is gonna combine with the oxygen that you breathe, and then you'll get rid of a couple of waste products as a result in the end, carbon dioxide and water. Oddly enough, it's the same net process, and that's why they can just burn your food in one of these bomb calorimeters to figure out how many calories are in it because it's the same process, it gives off the same amount of energy Either way, whether you burn it or whether it's happening inside your body in an enzymatic process. All right, so this is calorimetry. And basically what you wanna find out is typically what is the heat capacity 
of your calorimeter. And that heat capacity uh, basically is just how many joules of energy does it take, or calories it could be, but mostly joules in this case, uh, at least for this course. But how many joules of energy does it take to raise this entire calorimeter one degree Celsius. And that way, let's say I told you it was 10,000 joules, 10,000 joules to raise this one degree Celsius. Well, that way, if you knew a reaction happened in here and the, the temperature out here went up two degrees Celsius, well, if it's 10,000 joules to cause it to go up one degree, well then 20,000 joules. So it would be what it would take to cause it to go up two degrees. And so once you know that heat capacity, you can just multiply it by the corresponding change in temperature to figure out how much heat was either given off or so taken in by that lovely chemical reaction. And so in this case, we're gonna do a practice question on your handout there, and it says, if an object absorbs a thousand joules of heat and its temperature increases five degrees, what is the heat capacity? So first off, we have to realize that when we're saying what is the heat capacity, we're gonna solve for C here. So I'm gonna rearrange this equation here, and we're gonna get Q over delta T equals capital C there. So we're gonna solve for this heat capacity. And in this case, we're told that a thousand joules of energy of heat is transferred. So, and the result is a temperature change of five degrees. And again, whether I look at this as Kelvin or Celsius, it does not matter. So I'm just gonna do it based, now they just said five degrees. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this in degrees Celsius. It could have been Kelvin, whatever. And we'll find out that this heat capacity here was 200 joules per degree Celsius. And again, what that really means is that we'd have to add 200 joules of heat to our calorimeter to cause it to go up one degree Celsius, or we'd have to remove 200 joules of heat to cause the temperature to go down one degree Celsius. Cool, that's all this you know, basic kind of calculation is with one of these lovely bomb calorimeters. But we can make this a little more complicated with this bomb calorimeter. Again, it's not pure water out here. There's water out here, but the walls are made of some thick insulating material, and there's lots of things going on out here. But sometimes you're just transferring heat into or out of, not like a calorimeter like this, but just into a pure substance. And we're gonna have a, just a slightly different looking equation here. All right, so if you've got a specific substance that you're transferring heat into or out of, so then this would actually be the relevant equation. So you've got the Q here, the amount of heat transfer in or out of that substance is equal to the mass of the substance times what we call the specific heat. It's kind of like a heat capacity, but it's the heat capacity of one gram of that substance. It's the amount of heat it takes to change the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. So you can kind of think of it as the heat capacity of a substance, but specifically the heat capacity of one gram of that substance. And then we've got delta T again, uh, change in temperature. So if you take a look at a couple of specific heats here, so like the specific heat of liquid water, and I have to say liquid water because it turns out that gaseous water steam or solid water ice have different heat capacities. So heat capacities, or these specific heats I really should say, are phase dependent. And the specific heat of water, it turns out is 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius or per Kelvin, it could have been either way. And so it's the heat capacity, the joules per degree Celsius for one gram per gram of that substance. So if you wanna change one gram of liquid water, you wanna change the temperature one degree Celsius, it's gonna take 4.18 joules. Now, technically that's actually, that number should look a little familiar. That is where the, the calorie got its definition. The calorie was actually defined as the specific heat of water. Now, if we compare this, let's say, to the specific heat of say, solid aluminum, this is gonna be 0 0.90 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And so you look at these two different numbers and this should tell you something. You want to get in a habit of realizing what it tells you. So it takes a lot less heat to change aluminum's temperature one degree. So for at least one gram of it, than it tends to take the one, uh, the, a one degree Celsius temperature change for one gram of water. What this really means is that water can store a lot more energy. So than aluminum. So if you gave enough heat to raise water's temperature, say five degrees, that'd be like around 20 joules, that would be enough to change the aluminum temperature by more than 20 degrees. This is why like, you know, if I gave you the option, let's go out, I live in Arizona here, and we're gonna go out in the middle of August on a 115 degree Fahrenheit day, it's gonna be hot. And you have a choice, there's gonna be a kiddie pool full of water sitting there, so, or there's gonna be a park bench made of pure aluminum, exactly the same weight as the water in the kiddie pool. And I'm gonna stick them both out in the hot Arizona sun in the middle of August, in the middle of the afternoon. And my question for you is, do you wanna sit on the aluminum park bench 
in shorts, or do you want to put your feet, bare feet, into the kiddie pool full of water? And you should definitely choose the water. The park bench is gonna be way hotter. The idea is that if they've sat in the Arizona sun for the same amount of time, the same amount of energy from the sun will have been transferred into them. But that same amount of energy is gonna change aluminum's ten temp temperature way more. And so the idea is that the same cue is passed on to the water or the aluminum. And it's the same mass. I define you know, the amount of water in the kiddie pool as the same as the mass of the park bench. So, but with a much lower specific heat for the aluminum, it's gonna have to have a much larger change in temperature for the cues to be equal. And with that much larger change in temperature, the aluminum is gonna end up at a much higher temperature than the water is. And so a lot of students look at this and like, oh, a higher specific heat means it's gonna end up at a hotter, hotter temperature if I put them in the sun or something like that. No, no, actually the higher specific heat means it's gonna end up at a lot lower temperature. This is also why, like if you live on the coast for, you know, like let's say you lived in, you know, Oregon or California or uh, some other country with a coast, like on the coast of England or something like that. What you'll notice that for country, you know, for, for people that live on the coast or, or just climates that are near the coast, they're much more temperate. So like in the summer, they're much cooler. And the idea is that because water has a rather high specific heat, it can store a lot of heat energy. And so a lot of that heat energy that's coming off the sun is actually being stored in the water and the water's temperature doesn't raise that much because it takes a lot of energy to raise its temperature. And so it keeps the surrounding air also cooler as well because the air and the water are gonna kind of try to reach some sort of thermal equilibrium, we say. Cool, same thing happens in the winter. So in this case, water's gonna be absorbing heat all day long and then releasing it all night long and stuff like this. Uh, and keeping, because it stores so much heat during the day, it'll keep it from getting so cold at night and stuff like this. And so having water nearby, whether that be an ocean or a big lake or something like that, often tends to moderate your temperatures both in the summer as well as the winter, just due to water's rather high specific heat. All right, but this is our lovely equation for calculating heat changes associated with a specific substance now. So again, we already did with a bomb calorimeter, it was just Q equals C delta T with a capital C, but now we've got a lowercase c, which is the specific heat of a substance. And so if you're transferring heat into or, or out, not of a calorimeter, but just of a specific substance, here's the equation of interest. Now, one thing you should note, and we're gonna put a big curve up on the board here, and this curve is going to have temperature on the y-axis and it's going to have heat on the x-axis. And what we'll find is that as we add heat to a solid substance, its temperature is going to go up until a certain point. And all of a sudden you're going to keep adding heat and the temperature is not going to change. So, and it turns out that's what happens when you go through a phase change. And so right here, so we had a solid and it just went through its melting temperature, hitting that phase change of going from a solid to a liquid. But once it's all melted, then you keep adding more heat and the temperature is gonna go up again. Cool, and that'll continue. And then all of a sudden it will flatline yet again. Make this a little longer. Cool, and that happens because you've reached another phase change. And so again, we went from solid to liquid, well now the next phase change will be liquid to gas. We're gonna start boiling instead of melting. And so this temperature right here would now correspond to the boiling temperature of whatever liquid you happen to have here in this case. But once all that liquid has been converted into gas, once it's all boiled off, its temperature will begin to rise again as you add more heat. And so this lovely graph right here is often what we call the heating curve. And so, and what we got to learn to deal with is these phase transitions, because as long as you're just in the solid phase or just in the liquid phase or just in the gas phase here. So, well, then you've got you're adding heat and the temperature's changing, the temperature's changing, the temperature's changing. And as long as you're adding heat and the temperature's changing to substance, this is the relevant equation. And so as long as you're in this area right here, we've got Q equals MC delta T right here. Q equals MC delta T. And once again, Q equals MC delta T. So as long as you're not going through a phase change, that's when Q equals MC delta T is useful to you. But when you go through a phase change, it does require heat, but the temperature doesn't change. And if the temperature doesn't change, then this equation is worthless to you, it turns out. And so what do you do when you're going through one of those phase changes? Well, you got to, turns out, look up what's called the delta H of fusion. Turns out fusion means melting. We'll review this in a little bit. So delta H of fusion or the delta H of melting. So 
in this case is a scaled value that tells you, you know, you look them up for different substances. We could look it up for water, let's say. So, and what you'll do to calculate Q is you'll take and multiply it by the N here, which stands for the number of moles of that substance you have, or potentially, let's get this looking good. Or you might have to multiply it by the number of grams. It really depends. Sometimes the delta H diffusion are given to you in units of like joules or kilojoules per mole. And so if they give you this value and that's for one mole, well then if you have two moles, you'll have to double it, multiply by two. But sometimes I'll give it to you in units of joules or kilojoules per gram, in which case then you'd have to multiply by how many grams you have instead. And so I couldn't give you one equation. I will tell you that the top one here is the more common one for you to see in your high school or even college class. So, but I just want to make sure I'm covering my bases just in case they give you units of like joules or kilojoules per gram instead of joules or kilojoules per mole. But that's how you calculate how much heat is required to go through fusion. It depends on this value that you'd get provided. So from, or from some thermodynamic data in the back of a textbook. And then you multiply by either the number of moles of the substance you have or the number of grams of the substance you have. So something similar when you're boiling here. So boiling is called vaporization. And so here to calculate the amount of heat, it would be N times the delta H of vaporization or M times the delta H of vaporization. And once again, that just refers to uh, the units they give you the delta H of vaporization. You're more likely to get it in joules or kilojoules per mole. And so you multiply by the number of moles. But if they do give it to you in joules or kilojoules per gram, you'll multiply by the number of grams. Now, one thing you note, these are for the phase changes of melting and boiling. However, if you're going through condensation, which is gas to liquid, then you would just have to use the negative of this value. It turns out if you do the backwards process, it's just the exact negative of the value going forward. So it'd be the negative going back. Same thing, instead of, if, instead of melting, if you're freezing, then you would just use the negative of the delta H of fusion. And we're almost always only gonna supply you with either fusion and vaporization values, not freezing or condensation values. And you have to know to change the sign if you're doing the opposite process. Cool. So this is our heating curve, and we use this to calculate uh, temperature changes when we add heat, or when we know the temperature change, how much heat was required to cause it, things of this sort. And the idea is that for any change in temperature within a single phase, you're just going to use MC delta T. So, but once you cross a phase change, you've got a new equation to use. And if you, you know, cross multiple areas, you might have to do a multi-part calculation. So the one we're going to take a look at here, so is how much heat would it uh, would be required to raise 90 grams of ice from negative 20 degrees Celsius. So we'll go down here, 90 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius. So we're definitely below the freezing point of ice. You should know that the freezing point or melting point of ice is zero degrees Celsius. We're definitely below that melting point. And we wanna end up at 30 degrees Celsius. So we wanna end up somewhere up here at positive 30 degrees Celsius. And so to do this, first thing that we're gonna have to do is heat up the ice up to zero degrees Celsius, the melting temperature. But then it's going to melt, and the melting process itself is gonna require more heat. So, and once it's all melted, then the temperature will start going back up of the liquid water, and we'll have another step in the calculation. And so in this case, we can see that heating up the ice, we're all within a phase, that's gonna be an MC delta T type calculation, and we'll specifically need the specific heat of the ice. So, and then the phase change going from solid to liquid, we'll need the delta H of fusion in either set of units for specifically water. And then once it's all melted, then we'll be heating up the water from zero degrees Celsius up to 30 degrees Celsius, and we'll need the specific heat of liquid water. And so those are the kind of data we need, and we can typically look up those on the internet, or uh, oftentimes they're provided in thermodynamic data uh, in the back of a textbook, or in this case, I put them right on the study guide so we could actually do this calculation. Uh, but that's what we want to do here. And in this case, uh, we're going to have a three-part calculation, heating up the ice, melting the ice, heating up the water. That's the way it's going to work here. And essentially, every time you hit a corner, you'll have to start a new calculation. And so we'll go from uh, negative 20 to zero, melting, and then zero to 30 for the liquid water and that three-part calculation. All right, I'm going to actually identify this. This is going to be step number one. This will be step number three. And then we'll have step number two. So we can kind of match them out here. So step one will be Q equals MC delta T. 
so will step three. And then step two will be the phase change melting. And more often than not, your delta H effusion again will be given in joules or kilojoules per mole, and you multiply by how many moles you have, not by how many grams. That'll be the case in the data I've provided on the study guide here. So in this case, for step one, this is for heating up the ice. For step two, this is for heat, I'm sorry, step three, this is for heating up the liquid water. So, and once again, for step two, this is melting or fusion. And there we go. So I need the specific heat of ice, and that's provided in the table given to you on your handout. And the specific heat of ice is 2.03 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And so in this case, we'll have Q equals 90 grams of water in this problem, times specific heat, the 2.03 joules per gram per degree Celsius. Could have been per Kelvin as well. And then our delta T. And in this case for the ice, just heating up the ice to the melting point is from negative 20 up to zero. And so we take final minus initial, zero degrees Celsius minus a negative 20 degrees Celsius. And notice subtracting a negative is the same thing as adding. And so this overall is gonna come out to positive 20 degrees Celsius for the temperature change. And again, as long as your temperature is going up, that's a positive temperature change. So it should have come out that way. And we will grab a calculator here in a sec to carry that out. I like when I'm doing my calculations like this, I like grouping all the similar calculations together and doing them at the same time. So here we'll do MC delta T for step three as well. In this case, we've still got 90 grams of water. But now the specific heat of liquid water is given as 4.18 joules per gram per degree Celsius. And our delta T, final minus initial is 30 minus zero. So 30 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius, final minus initial. And once again, it's gonna come out positive since our temperature is going up. And again, whether we've done this in Celsius or Kelvin, so this could have been instead of 30 minus zero, it could have been 303 minus 273 and it still would have come out to 30. One of the biggest mistakes students make is they'll calculate this out to be 30 degrees Celsius as a temperature change and then try to add 273 to it. And again, that's what you'll do to change a temperature from Celsius to Kelvin, but a temperature change from Celsius to Kelvin, there's no conversion. It's the same numerical value either way. Keep that in mind. Super important here. All right, finally for step two with our fusion here. So our delta H of fusion is given as 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So this is the amount of heat required to melt one mole of water. Well, we were told we have 90 grams of water. We weren't actually told how many moles of water we have. So we have to figure out how many moles of water are in 90 grams of water. And so we'll take that 90 gram sample, H2O. And in this case, one mole of water, well, if you recall, H has got a molar mass of one gram per mole. Oxygen's got a molar mass of 16 grams per mole. So water's formula weight here is going to be 18 grams for one mole. And in this case, 90 divided by 18, I chose the numbers nice. So this would come out to exactly five moles of water. And so in our case, we'll multiply this 6.01 kilojoules per mole by N again, which represents the number of moles, which would be five. And five moles times 6.01 kilojoules per mole will be what we get for Q here. And this is where I pull out my calculator. All right, so we'll start off with 90 times 2.03 times 20. And you could approximate this in your head, not too bad, but in this case, 36.54. And if you look at the units here, the grams cancel, the degrees Celsius cancel, and it comes out in joules. So this one here, five times 6.01. is 30.05, but it's gonna be in units of kilojoules. And we'd have to multiply by a thousand to put it in joules, because this one's gonna come out in joules as well. And if we just add joules and kilojoules, we're adding apples and oranges. So I'm gonna convert this into joules right off the bat here. So in this case, so if the units work out, I'll take my one kilojoule is 10 to the third joules and do the conversion right along the way. So that's multiplying by a thousand. So instead of 30.05 kilojoules, we're going to get 
30,050 joules instead. And then finally for this last step, we'll have 90 times 4.18 times 30. And we'll get 11,286. And then we'll simply add these three steps together to get that total amount of heat required to raise 90 grams of ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius to be 90 grams of liquid water at positive 30 degrees Celsius. So in this case, 11,286 plus that 30,050 plus that 3,654 gets us a whopping total of 44,990. Cool, now if you're taking a multiple choice test, they could be looking for you to have this answer in joules or kilojoules technically. And so you might have to convert this at the end. And if so, then this would be 44.9 kilojoules. The conversion would be dividing by a thousand. So either one of those could be the correct answer on a multiple choice exam. And that's calorimetry. So if you found this lesson helpful, please consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to support the channel. And if you're looking for the study guide for this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems on calorimetry, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.